This is episode number 26 with Patrick McKeown. For decades, they've been told, take deep breaths, take big breaths. Oxygen is good, carbon dioxide is bad, get in as much oxygen as possible, get rid of as much toxins as possible. And it's all nonsense. One guy says to me one day, he says, he said, Patrick, he says, they couldn't have all got it wrong. I said, I think they have. Now, I don't mean all is 100%, but I think the vast majority. Welcome to the Anchors of Health Podcast, where it's all about helping you achieve the best health you possibly can. And I do that by bringing on world-class experts under four key anchors of health, which is mindset, nutrition, movement, and recovery. Within each, it's all about finding what works for you. I'm your host, Bill Choi, and today's episode is all about breathing with international best-selling author and master instructor, Patrick McKeown. He's the creator of the Oxygen Advantage Technique and the author of The Oxygen Advantage, which is a fantastic book. Highly recommend it. Over the last 15 years, he has trained more than 7,000 people around the world to safely challenge their bodies and produce positive changes. So in this episode, you'll learn why everyone should be breathing through the nose versus the mouth, what is causing children and adults to become mouth breathers, a simple technique you can use to open up clogged and stuffy noses. He literally walks us through how to do it. He also walks us through some of his favorite breathing exercises and so much more. You'll learn a new way to breathe. So I'm super excited for you to listen to this one. If you want the show notes and links to everything we discussed, just head over to anchorsofhealth.com slash 26. So let's jump right in. Here's my conversation with Patrick. Patrick, welcome to the Anchors of Health podcast. Thank you so much, Bill. Thanks for coming on, Patrick. Uh, I read your book, The Oxygen Advantage, which is all about breathing, and it is easily one of the most overlooked aspects of our health. So I'm excited to have you on to talk about it. But let's start with you first. Give us a glimpse into your personal journey and how you discovered the importance of breathing properly. Sure. Um, I came across it totally by accident. I suppose, you know, my training, my high school, into university, I was preparing myself more for the business world. My background was economics and social sciences. So at the time, you know, from being a young child all the way into university, into my mid-teens, into my 20s, I had chronic asthma. With that, my nose was constantly stuffed. And if your nose is stuffed, you tend to mouth-breathe. And when you mouth-breathe then, you are left with, generally with higher levels of anxiety, but also sleep issues. So people with asthma, people with poor breathing patterns, as you have when you have the condition, um, you tend to have poor breathing patterns. And then we're, we're more stressed than the general population, and we're also more tired. So I, even though like I was going to doctors for many, many years, and taking whatever medication doctors were, were prescribing for me. It, it was in 1997 or 1998 that I read a newspaper article about the importance of breathing through the nose and the work of a Russian doctor called Konstantin Buteko. So I started putting his technique, a little bit that I could get at the time, into practice. And I was able to open up my nose by simply holding my breath. Um, and it's, you know, one exercise that I've used with tens of thousands of people is through the box, through direct hands-on training, you know, there's never a reason to have a stuffy nose. You can fix it very, very quickly. And in many instances without surgery, um, it's not invasive and without medication, you know, and I'm not just overselling that. Like really when we tap into what the capabilities are of the human body, once we're aware of it, it's amazing that the human body is able to heal itself. And the one thing about nose breathing is the more you breathe through your nose, the better it works for you. But if you don't breathe through your nose, you'll tend to be upper chest breathing. You've got reduced oxygen uptake in the blood. You've got reduced oxygen delivery to the cells. You're more tired and you're more stressed. So I would say one of the worst habits that anybody can have, and we know 50% of children are persistently mouth breathing. We don't have a figure for adults, but we know it's going to be considerably high. And certainly individuals over 40 years of age, they're six times more likely to breathe through the nose and their mouth during sleep. And as a result, then they're going to have increased risk of sleep disorder, waking up tired. This in turn then reduces concentration, productivity and focus. So get your breathing right. You know, it's the one thing to ensure that you've got adequate oxygenation um, of tissues and organs, including the heart and brain. So Patrick, is it just congestion and stuffy noses that are causing us to become mouth breathers? Because we're all born breathing through our noses, right? So what is causing people yeah. to change to mouth breathers? It's recognized that, you know, any, any obstruction of the nose can cause the individual to switch from nose to mouth breathing because if, if your nose feels stuffy, 
it just doesn't feel comfortable breathing through it. So it's kind of inevitable then that you switch to mouth breathing. But once you change to mouth breathing, that's it. So that's a vicious circle then because the nose gets blocked. The nose regulates itself by breathing through it. So even though people are aware of, you know, you, you breathe in through your nose, you, as you, the air is coming in through the nasal cavity, it becomes warm and it becomes moist. And these conditions are very favorable then for gas exchange to take place from the lungs to the blood. But you can imagine that the body now has expended a certain amount of energy in warming and moistening that incoming air. And it's just as important to breathe out through your nose because it says the breath is leaving the body out through the nose. The nose traps the heat and moisture. And it's by trapping the heat and moisture that it helps to regulate um, how open or closed it is. Now, there's other gases that play a role there. Carbon dioxide seems to have some suppression of mast cells. And mast cells, they play a role in inflammation, including in the release of histamine, which is a factor, you know, with allergic rhinitis and perennial rhinitis. That's why people will take antihistamines, for example. So like, it's, re it's really amazing, you know, the whole industry, antihistamines, nasal steroids, um, operations of the nose. And, you know, I think many, many people, once you start adopting simple strategies to help open up your nose and you switch to breathing through it, you'll, you'll start seeing tr quite tremendous improvements. And also your sleep, that's really the big thing about it. Your sleep patterns will get better. You can't have a good night's sleep if you're waking up with a dry mouth in the morning. And Patrick, do you think that there's a possibility that some of us are just mouth breathers and some of us are nose breathers or a combination of both? Yeah, no, it's, it's um, you know, it can be difficult enough to quantify. There's no clinical way of screening for mouth breathing. Um, you know, it, the definition of mouth breathing, nobody has come up with a definition of it. Generally, it's taught that you have the mouth open for significant periods of time and it, it's lasting over six months. And that would be, you know, the time frame to be considered a mouth breather. But people do. They switch from mouth to nose breathe. There's going to be a cohort of people who, no matter what, they persistently mouth breathe. And then there's going to be probably a larger group of people who switch from mouth to nose breathing, mouth, nose breathing, etc. How can one figure out if they're a nose or mouth breather? Because most people don't even think about this. It is, you know, like it's one of those things. I think we should be thinking about it. Um, to give you a couple of things about mouth breathing, mouth breathing during childhood, it you a child will not reach their full genetic potential, and I don't say that just as a you know as an oversell or a scare tactic. Look at the effects of mouth breathing. Look at the effects of persistent mouth breathing. Craniofacial abnormalities. Mouth breathers will tend to have very narrow jaws, very high upper palate, and their jaws are set back in their face, and this increases the risk of lifelong sleep apnea. Every one year of using a pacifier increases the risk of mouth breathing by 25% in children. How many children are using a pacifier for three to four years? So it's almost guaranteeing that the pacifier use is going to result in mouth breathing. Mouth breathing also, you tend to use the accessory muscles of respiration, upper chest muscles, you use the scalenes, you use the sternocloid and mastoid muscles. So you're not using your diaphragm as effectively as you would do. Mouth breathing also leads to the... the presence or creation of forward head posture. So you've got reduced respiratory muscle strength. And, you know, really when we're not using our breathing muscles effectively, it's our sleep again is, is going to be affected because the condition of obstructive sleep apnea, that happens as a result of collapse of the upper airways during sleep. And collapse of the upper airways will occur when the negative pressure created during inspiration exceeds the dilating force of the upper airways to keep the airways open. In other words, as you're sucking air into your lungs, there's a negative pressure created during the act of breathing. And it's the muscles in the throat that are designed to keep that airway open. But if those muscles aren't working effectively, the throat, the area around the throat, the epiglottis, etc., and the, the nasopharynx, the oropharynx, so especially more the oropharynx. So the throat where it meets the mouth, the epiglottis, um, and down lower, you know, into the throat, even into the larynx, you can have collapse of the airways there. The individual stops breathing, their blood oxygen saturation decreases, they're brought out of deep sleep. There's a tremendous negative you know, effect on the heart. Um, oftentimes it leads to hypertension, fibrillation, arrhythmias, uh, palpitations, and overall stress drive, you know, so it's not a good condition. But 
if we leave children with their mouths wide open, these kids, the habit of mouth breathing during childhood is going to carry on for the rest of these kids' life. And aesthetically, the kids won't, you know, they won't develop the faces that they should do. They'll tend to have a longer face, a more narrow face. Um, in the corporate world, there was a very interesting study. It was published by one of the universities in, in California. And they looked at Fortune 500 CEOs and they measured the height to width ratio of the face. CEOs with wider faces make more money. Now, you could wonder, okay, it's a very strange study or whatever. It's not really because a man or a woman with a well-developed face has a well-developed airway. And if you have a well-developed airway, your sleep is going to be good. And if your sleep is going to be good, then you're waking up alert. And if you're alert, you're going to be more focused, more productive, and more likely to be no smoother. So I can understand it totally. I was the opposite of that all the way through university. You know, I was required to go in there, sit in at your lectures, um, you know, do your tasks, get the results. And yes, I did it, but it took a hell of a lot of work. And that's the, re that's the, you know, the main difference between somebody who's mouth breathing and nose breathing. Mouth breathing will certainly reduce concentration in a lot of people. Um, so their ability to hold their attention on something for a period of time is being reduced. And it's not because these people aren't intelligent. It's because they have a habit that they're not utilizing their, their capacity to their full potential because, and nobody's telling these kids any different. So whether it's a young child, whether it's a teenager, whether it's your student going to university, or whether it's your, your corporate, one thing we need is an ability to handle stress. We need good resilience to be able to cope with what life throws at us. And also we need focus, concentration, and energy. And your breathing is going to influence that. And I'm not talking about taking a deep breath spill. I'm not talking about what's commonly taught, you know, in um, by many, many people in different modalities, for example, Western yoga, Pilates, stress counseling, etc. We're talking about functional breathing, which is breathing through the nose, using the diaphragm. It's light, it's quiet, it's regular, and there's a gentle pause on the exhale. And that's functional breathing patterns. And it's through the breath, you know, how you breathe, you can literally influence your blood circulation. 100,000 miles of blood vessels in the body. And you can also influence the amount of oxygen that's delivered from the blood to the cells. Fantastic. And, you know, so as you mentioned, right, uh, a lot of us are dealing with nasal congestion, clogged noses, stuffy noses yes. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Some might even have a clear airway in one nostril and not the other. So what are some ways that people can clear nasal passages without medication? Sure. Very, very simple. Don't, don't do this exercise if, if any of your listeners are pregnant um, or if you have any kind of serious medical conditions, don't do it. If you want to open up your nose, simply stand up. Take a breath in through your nose, small breath in through your nose, small breath out through your nose, pinch your nose, and start walking while you hold your breath. And walk until you build up, a, say, a medium air hunger, and then let go of your nose and breathe through your nose. Continue breathing through your nose, wait a minute and do it again, and practice that five times. And your nose should be decongested in about four to five minutes. So I'll just repeat it again. You take a normal breath in through your nose, a normal breath out through your nose, you pinch your nose, you hold your nose. Start walking as you hold your breath. Keep walking until you feel a medium to strong air hunger. When you feel a medium to strong air hunger, let go of your nose, breathe in through your nose and calm your breathing. Then normal breathe for about a minute and then repeat. And most, most of your people, 95% of them will find that their nose will open. Wow. And, and, and I as, actually also saw another one of your exercises on YouTube, I believe, where mm -hmm. you had people hold their noses and shake their heads up and down. How, yes, how effective yes. is that method? I mean, yeah, no, it's the same. It wouldn't be quite as strong as the one I just gave you. Um, oh, really? It's good. Okay. It works. Okay. You get a stronger effect if you walk around. Okay. And you've tried that with kids as well? Thousands. <laughs> okay. Yes. Great. Um, even five year old kids coming into us, you know, they're coming in with mouth breathing, their mouth is open, they've got long, low tone posture. Um, we use a little bit of paper tape with them, you know, they come into the class, we tape up the kids, we ask the moms, dads, you know, can we put a little piece of paper tape across their lips? It's no issue. And the parents also do, they put the paper tape across the lips, just to show example to the child. 
And then we have the children do this simple exercise. And we can open up a child's nose very, very quickly. Now, if they're adenoids, it takes a little bit longer. And we have to kind of get the child breathing through the nose um, to help shrink the adenoids. And we're not sure how it's happening. It could be, you know, there's a gas called nitric oxide that's released into the nasal cavity. Um, and basically, nitric oxide is, is a, it plays quite a good role in terms of sterilization of the air as it comes into your lungs. It also plays a role in bronchodilation and in, in opening up the airways. And it plays a role in gas exchange. Um, because if you look at the human lungs, most blood concentration of the lungs is in the lower part of the lungs. As human beings, we're upright. You know, we're either sitting upright, we're standing for most of our day. And because of gravity, the greatest concentration of blood is in the lower lobes. When you breathe through your nose, you're more likely to use your diaphragm. Your nose is directly connected with your diaphragm. So by breathing through your nose, you take the air deeper into the lungs. And also, as you, you breathe in through your nose, you pick up nitric oxide. And nitric oxide helps to redistribute the blood from the lower lobes of the lungs to the upper. So now you have a better gas exchange taking place because the ratio of air meeting blood is, is better. Um, so it's estimated, one, one researcher, Swift, I think back in 1988, they had individuals, their jaws were wired shut and literally they were forced to, after having jaw surgery, and they were forced to breathe through their nose and the amount of oxygen uptake in the blood had increased by 10 to 15%. So nose breathers, better oxygenated than mouth breathers. So Patrick, where do people start? If people want to, you know, they're mouth breathers right now and they want to get started on trying to become nose breathers, is it taking the body oxygen level test, the bolt test? And if so, can you explain what it is and what it means? Sure. The, the bolt is basically, it's the length of time that you can hold your breath for comfortably. You'll get this online as well, you know, just in case you can't pick it up from what I'm saying. You're taking a normal breath into your nose, normal breath out to your nose. You're pinching your, your nose with your fingers. And then you're timing it in seconds. How long does it take until you feel the first definite desire to breathe? When you feel the first definite desire to breathe, let go, breathe in through your nose and your breath should be relatively calm. And that's your bolt score. It's a very good measurement of exercise tolerance and it's a good measurement of functional breathing patterns. Individuals with a bolt score above 25 seconds are more likely to nose breathe, are more likely to breathe slow, are, no, are more likely to breathe using their diaphragm, are less likely to have exercise induced asthma, are more likely to be calm and are less likely to be stressed. So individuals with a bolt score of less than 25 seconds, um, it demonstrates that there's a high risk or a high chance of you having breathing pattern issues and that's going to affect you in some way. You know, it depends on genetics, um, but we would say yes, I think anybody with a low bolt score you know, you don't get away with it. Your energy levels are affected. Your stress levels are affected. Your exercise capacity is going to be affected. So it's really worthwhile in terms of getting the bolt score up. And all it takes is a bit of practice, you know. Three pillars to it. Switch to nose breathing. Don't give in to frequent sighing. And practice to breathe light exercise whereby you slow down your breathing to create air hunger. And by doing that, you know, it's resetting your breathing or changing your breathing pattern to more functional breathing and can you give us so i guess you have some exercises as well that people can do to you know increase their bolt score as well right yeah like there's a series of exercises the main exercise in terms of doing the in terms of improving the bolt score is doing the breathe light exercise and it's, it's pretty it's pretty helpful in terms of all you're doing is you put one hand on your chest one hand on your tummy <clears throat> now, it takes a bit of practice, okay? So, I'm go through it with you. You can see what you can get out of it. Um, one hand on your chest, one hand on your tummy. And pay full attention to the breath as it comes in and out of your nose. So, you're feeling the slightly colder air coming into your nose and you're feeling the slightly warmer air as it leaves your nose. As you feel your breathing, gently start softening the breath. So, you're slowing down the speed of air as it comes into your nose really gradually and softly and slow slow down the speed of air as it comes into your nose and at the top of the breath bring a total feeling of relaxation to your body and have a gentle and relaxed breath out so you know you're focusing on the airflow as it comes into your nose you're really slowing down the speed of the air as it comes into your nose at the top of the breath bring a total feeling of relaxation to the body 
and have a relaxed breath out. Your visual movements should be, from your breathing, your visual movements should have reduced by about 30%. And you're slowing down your breathing to the point that you feel air hunger. And you want to maintain that feeling of air hunger for about three to four minutes. Now, the air hunger just tells you that carbon dioxide is accumulated in the blood because oxygen isn't your primary stimulus to breathe during your regular breathing. Um, it's carbon dioxide that's the primary stimulus to breathe. And carbon dioxide is not just a waste gas because it plays a role in opening up your blood vessels and it also plays a role in the release of oxygen from hemoglobin to your, your tissues. So when you really slow down your breath and you feel air hunger, it's telling you that carbon dioxide has increased in the blood. Carbon dioxide then starts opening up your blood vessels so you feel a difference to your body temperature. And carbon dioxide is also a catalyst for the release of oxygen from the red blood cells to the cell. So the ironic thing about breathing, Bill, is if you want to get more oxygen delivered throughout the body, you should be breathing lightly. And in actual fact, for many modern people, we should be breathing less um, because so many factors are affecting our breathing. And probably the biggest one is stress. Like, you know, when I'm introducing this to somebody, they're saying, you're telling me to underbreed. Um, and, you know, they can't get it because for decades they've been told, take deep breaths, take big breaths, oxygen is good, carbon dioxide is bad, get in as much oxygen as possible, get rid of as much toxins as possible. And it's all nonsense. It really, really is. And one guy says to me one day, he says, he said, Patrick, he says, they couldn't have all got it wrong. I said, I think they have. Now, I don't mean all is 100%, but I think the vast majority um when people talk about breathing, I cringe. We shouldn't be talking about breathing unless we have a basic understanding of the physiology of breathing. If you were to take a run with an elite athlete and you were running down the street with them, how is that athlete going to breathe? They're not going to be huffing and puffing. They're not like going to be panting like a train. But if you were to look at an unfit, unhealthy person taking a run, you will see that they will have disproportionate breathlessness to their physical exercise. We need to have economical breathing. We're just like cars, you know. Do you have a big Hummer, which is consuming a gas guzzler, consuming 10 miles to the gallon? Or do you have a car which is really efficient, um, you know, that's, that's getting from A to B with, with as little fuel as possible? And that's where it's about. And even in the car industry, you know, you look at the cars coming out of America now, look at Tesla. Um, economical, efficient, and uh, good for everybody, including the environment. Well, humans are the same. You know, if you have an inefficient human, their breathing is too much. And breathing too much, you know, they're literally depriving themselves of oxygen. And Patrick, in your book, a lot of your exercises that you have, the breathing exercises that you have, you say to hold your breath after the exhale versus yes. on the inhale. Yes. Can you explain why that's important? Yeah, it's deliberate, it's intentional, and it's got a better effect. Councilman was a very famous swimming coach in America in the United States in the 1980s and he used what he called hypoxic training with his athletes and he would ask them to breathe in and hold. Now, if you breathe in and hold, you're unlikely to create a hypoxic effect and what I mean by hypoxic is that your blood oxygen saturation will drop to below 91%. Normally, you know, if we put a pulse oximeter on somebody's finger, um, we'll see an SpO2 of about 95 to 99%. My intention with somebody doing the breath holding is that for athletes, now they have to be a relatively healthy person to do it because what I'm doing here is I'm challenging the boundaries of this individual. I have them take a normal breath in, normal breath out, pinch their nose, and I have them do a different exercise, walk, jog, whatever, while they hold their breath. And the whole purpose then is as you hold your breath, your cells continue to extract oxygen from the blood, but you're not replenishing it because you haven't resumed breathing. So your SpO2 is going to reduce. So you're creating a hypoxic response. You know, you're subjecting the body to reduced oxygenation. And that's good in terms of causing the body then to make adaptations. So it's like that we're stimulating anaerobic glycolysis, but we're not doing it by, by virtue of high intensity interval training. We're simply doing it by breath holding. Now, 
breath holding and walking or breath holding and jogging is less traumatic to the individual. So in terms of the ad adaptations that we would consider, if you hold your breath and your blood oxygen saturation is dropping, now there's less oxygen getting to the cells. The hydrogen ion coming from the cells doesn't get oxidized, doesn't form water. And instead, the hydrogen ion is associates with pyruvic acid and that then forms lactic acid. Lactic acid then dissociates into lactate and hydrogen ion. So you've got an, you've got an increased acidity as a result of doing the breath holding. Now, when we do a breath holding on the exhalation, we're also increasing CO2 in the blood because carbon dioxide isn't able to leave the body through the lungs. So it's going to accumulate in the blood. So we have a hypoxic hypercapnic response. Carbon dioxide in the blood is going to form carbonic acid. That then dissociates into hydrogen ion and bicarbonate. So you've got an increased hydrogen ion coming from the drop to oxygen, and you've got an increased hydrogen ion coming from the carbon dioxide effect. So you've got an, it's, it's a strong acidosis, and we're greatly disturbing the blood acid base balance, and that's going to then improve the, the buffering capacity. Now, where does the buffering capacity improve? It's probably inside in the muscle. Um, but it's not, not easy to identify. But researchers are using these exercises, um, exhale, hold, normal breath in, normal breath out, pinch and hold. And there's quite a few papers now coming out of Europe. And uh, most recent one showed that it, it improves repeated sprint ability in rugby players. And they are elite rugby players um, and significantly increasing it. You know, it's been tested in swimmers, in triathletes, in runners. Um, as I was saying there in team sports, but on a practical level, it's been used for people in MMA and you know serious sports with really which really demand which are really demanding on the body. So we want the body to. We're, I'm using breath holding to challenge the individual, to push their boundaries, to improve their buffering capacity, to delay lactic acid and fatigue, um, and very simply, we're doing it just by breath holding. Now the exercises. I do have, you know, they're slightly different in the book. I wrote the book for you know, was three years ago, I wrote the book. Um, since that, I've made some more changes to the exercise because I suppose it's like everything else. With experience, uh, you improve on what you know and you get feedback then on working with the athletes that you're doing it with. And we've been, we've been so fortunate. We've used it with elite athletes and we've got Olympic athletes training for Tokyo. They're putting it into practice, NFL players. They put it into practice, MMA fighters, um, sprinters, runners, swimmers. So across a variety of sports, we've seen, you know, good gains from a simple technique and two aspects to it. You know, when I look at the oxygen advantage, people say, well, it's a series of breathing exercises. It is. One is about addressing your functional breathing patterns because I want an athlete to have good breathing. I need, well, I need anybody who's coming into me. You know, my whole goal here is to try and, in part what, what it would mean if you have better breathing. And it's very simple. Your normal everyday breathing should be functional and it shouldn't be disturbed. Um, because if it's disturbed, then your stress and your focus and everything else is disturbed. But for an athlete, you need good diaphragmatic function because the diaphragm plays a role in, in spinal stabilization and good motor control. Functional movement requires functional breathing. If breathing is off, movement is going to be off. So that's why we want to get everyday breathing right. And then the other exercises are the, the exhale hold, and that's literally to challenge the body, add an extra load onto the breathing muscles, disturb the blood acid base balance. And there's been studies shown that it can improve aerobic capacity. Some non-responders, you know, we haven't seen it in terms of improving hemoglobin and hematocrit. We've seen it with some, but we haven't seen it with others, and we don't know why. So in terms of aerobic capacity, we can't always say it's 100%. In terms of improving anaerobic capacity, I'd be a lot more comfortable in saying we can really push the boundaries in this one. So Patrick, I just want to go back and just clarify. So are you saying that holding your breath after the exhale is just simply better than doing it after the inhale? Yes. Or are yes. you just saying doing it after the inhale is, is not bad, right? This is just better to do it after the exhale. Is that what you're saying? It depends on what you're looking for. If you breathe in and hold you're unlikely to drop blood oxygen saturation. So you can't make a claim that you're simulating high altitude training. You know, it's very easy, Bill, to check if somebody is simulating high altitude training or if they're, if they're practicing intermittent hypoxic training. 
you can buy a pulse oximeter and um, you pick them up on Amazon, buy a decent enough quality one, you know, that you kind of get a little bit of what you pay for, but at least spend 60 to a hundred dollars on it. Wear the pulse oximeter and you'll see with your normal breathing, your SpO2, which is the saturation of the peripheral blood vessels with oxygen or how fully loaded um, is your hemoglobin oxygen. You'll see that your readings are 95 to 99%. That's normal. If you're creating a hypoxic response, you have to be able to drop that SpO2 down to below 91%. And I've seen it with different products over the years, products coming out, making claims, hypoxic training, elevation training. Um, and, you know, I buy the products because I'm interested in it. I put on the SpO2, I put on the pulse oximeter, I wear it during physical exercise and I don't see a change. But then it's not creating a hypoxic effect. So we did the same test then with exercises, breathe in, hold. If you're a really practiced athlete, you can do it, um, but it takes a lot of work because if you breathe in and hold, you've got a lot of residual oxygen in the, in the lungs. You know, you've got to, if you've got to, it depends on the size of the breath in. So it's going to take a lot longer for your body to use up that oxygen because that oxygen is continuously going to diffuse from the lungs into the blood. And as a result, it, it's going to be more difficult to create a hypoxic response. So if you breathe in and hold, you're creating a hypercapnic response, which is good. You know, it's high CO2. But if you breathe in, you breathe out and hold, you create a hypoxic hypercapnic response. Low oxygen, high CO2, and that's that's more powerful because especially, you know, in terms of delaying lactic acid and fatigue. That's interesting. And the reason why I bring that up, Patrick, is because, you know, so I had really bad asthma growing up as a kid. And my yes. mom read something that mentioned swimming to help asthma. And as soon as yes. I started doing that, my asthma went completely away. And yes. I ended up swimming competitively for 12 years after that. And yeah. I used to always, you know, we had a pool in our backyard. I used to always play this game where I would throw the rings at each corner of the pool. And I would try to hold my breath and gather all the rings under one breath. And I used to play that game yes. all the time. And yeah. my asthma went completely away. So what's the correlation with all that? Hypercapnia, high CO2. Mm. If you look, you know, in terms of the, the first books I ever wrote, um, the first one I wrote was Asthma Free Naturally. Second one I wrote was Close Your Mouth. Third one was Always Breathe Correctly for Young Kids. All we were doing was getting individuals slow down their breathing to increase CO2 in the blood. Carbon dioxide is a natural bronchodilator, helps open up the airways. When you breathe slowly as well, it's almost that you're, you're adapting, you're changing neuroplasticity. So you're forming new neural connections in the brain. So that slow breathing then becomes a pattern as opposed to fast breathing. If you have an individual who's breathing lightly and breathing normally, there's less trauma on the airways. And this is especially you know relevant when it comes to somebody with asthma. If you have a person with asthma, they're breathing fast, they're breathing shallow, they're breathing through their mouth, they're taking cold, dry air into their airways. And that's going to suck moisture out of the airways. And that's going to cause, you know, bronchoconstriction that their airways will narrow. When their airways narrow, they feel they're not getting enough air. And as a result, then they breathe harder, but that's only going to feed back into their asthma. So asthma is one of those conditions where the condition feeds in on itself. Now, then when I look at somebody with asthma, I know it's not just asthma going on. I know it's generally, and they have higher stress levels than the normal population. That's been documented. We also know with asthma that the nose is more likely to be stuffed because inflammation that's happening in the lungs is going to travel up to the nose. And inflammation that's happening in the nose is going to travel down to the lungs. So I know, you know, if, if you go to a doctor, you'll go to an ear, nose and throat for your nose and you'll go to a pulmonologist for your lungs. But in actual fact, since 2007, it's been recognized to be one unified airway your nose and your lungs is linked. Now, if your nose is stuffy, then your sleep is affected. So here we have a group of people with asthma, children with asthma, their nose is affected, their sleep is affected, and their stress levels are affected. And we give them simple breath hold techniques, similar to swimming. The only difference is not a, not a huge amount of difference, you know. We breathe out and hold. Um, swimming, you were breathing in and holding. At the same time when you were swimming, you were feeling air hunger. So you were deliberately exposing and minimizing your breathing during the physical exercise. 
that's how you, you outgrew your asthma. You didn't outgrow it. Your mother intuitively realized um, that a child who's swimming, the very act of swimming where your breathing is restricted is going to have reset breathing. And as a result, it makes a massive difference to asthma. Now, the only thing as I'd say is swimming is brilliant. Chlorine can be problematic. And also, you know, let's teach the child or adult your breathing and your swimming is one thing, but how do you breathe when you get out of the pool? How do you breathe when you're walking down the street? How do you breathe when you're watching TV? How do you breathe in your car? How do you breathe during your sleep? So I want to look at breathing as a 24 hour basis. It's not just your breathing if you go to a class and you do a few breathing exercises, but then you forget all about it when you get out. No, that's no good. We want to get habits that we want to make changes to your breathing and that these changes, when they're positive, are going to carry through to the rest of your day. And it's something that you can carry on with for the rest of your life. Right. You bring up a good point. It's about the daily uh, incorporation of these great breathing habits. Mm-hmm. Um, you also recommend taping your mouth at night yes. right? for people yes. that, that are mouth breathers during the night. Can you explain that? Yes. Yeah, and it's uh, probably come as a bit of a shock to some I started taping up my mouth back in '97. It was the first time that I started waking up alert. Never could I ever, you know, I'd wake up and I'd just be tired. But, you know, you kind of get on with your day. Um, but no, it was it just made an absolute tremendous difference to my night's sleep. Taping now is becoming more in vogue. Um, there's even new tapes on the market, you know, that are developed by different companies. There's a few companies on the market, tapes specifically for the mouth. One, for example, that we use called Lip Seal Tape. And it's a very woven easy to use tape, you just position it over the lips and it forces you to breathe through your nose. Your nose will never get fully blocked if you continue nose breathing because even if your nose got a little bit stuffy, that will slow down your breathing and that that will help to open up your nose. So never worry about, you know, somebody having that the tape would be dangerous. It wouldn't be. Now we would say, of course, don't use the tape if you're after drinking alcohol, if you've got a tummy upset, it's not for kids. we, we do have some younger children, you know, well, the older kids, we might put a very small strip, but the parent has to be monitoring the kid totally. And we actually started off during the day. So I think it's a good point. We actually, the taping during the day, we do it for children um, when they're distracted, when they're watching TV, when they're on iPhone, because I want to establish neuroplasticity. I want the brain to connect the nose with breathing. And we do that by, by having the kids wear the tape during the day. And then with adults, any adult who's waking up at a dry mouth in the morning, you're not having a good night's sleep. And also, when you go to your dentist, ask, you know, what's wrong with, you know, your dentist may be saying, well, your gums look a little bit inflamed or you've got kind of dental cavities there, which are a little bit surprising. Um, mouth breathing causes and contributes to all that. Bruxism, you know, which is, is generally it's a sleep issue, but mouth breathing will also contribute to that. Temporomandibular joint problems. Mouth breathing can continue to contribute to that. If you have your mouth open during sleep, you're traumatizing the upper airways. It contributes to inflammation. It dries out the upper airways. It causes them to be more sticky, more liable to collapse, increase snoring, sleep apnea, etc. And let's just go back to the running and, and people that swim and cycle. What can you recommend for casual exercises as they go out jogging? and running endurance, should they be breathing through their noses in that, in, in that aspect as well? Yeah, it's, it's better. It's better. You know, you breathe through your nose. Your nose is not just the two holes in the face. All of our ancestors, they were nasal breathers. Like, you look at the skull of a Neanderthal, and um, the one thing you'll notice is that they have wide nostrils. Well, the wide nostrils were there for a purpose, and that was to breathe. So they had wide faces, wide nostrils to allow air to come in, even when they were doing physical exercise. And you can attain an 85 to 90 percent work rate by switching from mouth to nose breathing now if you've got very poor nostrils or poor nasal functioning you can buy little nasal dilators to help open up your nose one product that's often used in sports is called a turbine and by the way i don't have any financial interest from these companies that are, they're not mine nothing got to do with me and um, i'm familiar with the turbine because i sometimes i've done radio interviews for them and i've done it for another but you know, I think it's it's good that you can use a nasal dilator to help open up the nose so that you can breathe easier through it, especially if you especially if you don't have good nasal functioning. 
So you're much better, the quality of your physical exercise, your heart rate recovery, your, air, your airways, you know, if you have somebody there with asthma on a very warm day or even on a very cold day, and literally their airways are going to constrict in response to it. So nose breathing is going to greatly help with that. Nose breathing is going to slow down your breath, you know, and you, you'll get a pretty good pace, even with high intensity interval training. If you're doing 30 seconds all out or a minute all out, you'll maintain that for a minute nose breathing and then go back to your walk for a minute nose breathing and then high intensity interval for all out minute nose breathing and you'll be surprised i think people automatically just switch to mouth breathing just out of habit and the other thing is the higher your bowl score the easier it is to maintain nose breathing during exercise we want to get your bowl score up towards 30 40 seconds and if you've got a bowl score at that point you will find that your efficiency is so good in terms of breathing because now your breathing is light, you're economical with your air, and there is a cost associated with breathing. If you're doing physical exercise and you're huffing and puffing and you're panting like a dog, you know, that's not good. It's not good in terms of blood vessels, um, blood circulation. It's not good in terms of the amount of oxygen delivered to your heart. It's not good in the trauma and the airways. And there's a cost associated with breathing. If you're breathing too hard, a considerable amount of your oxygen consumption is being is devoted to supporting your breathing muscles. So, and 50% of athletes are prone to die from fatigue. You know, if you're really working and pushing your breathing muscles, you're you're putting a load on them. And um, if the diaphragm fatigues, blood is going to be stolen from the legs to support the diaphragm. And that's why we do diaphragm improve respiratory muscle strength as well. It's the same approach. You know, you hold your breath, you can improve diaphragmatic strength. Um, so yeah, that's pretty much it. And what about with like sprinting and swimming? Because swimming, it's kind of tough to breathe through the nose, right? Swim, swimming, it's pretty, it's very difficult. We don't, we don't advocate it for swimming. You know, the the main thing with swimming is to try and improve the amount of strokes that you have between breaths. Mm-hmm. So if you were looking at a swimmer, they need to have a good bolt score, and they need to have a good maximum breathlessness test. And you can measure this bill. You take a normal breath in through your nose, normal breath out to your nose, pinch your nose, hold your nose and start walking. Count how many paces you can hold your breath for as you walk and try and walk as many paces as possible. Then let go, breathe in through your nose. We want a swimmer to be able to walk about 80 paces on that one breath. Now, why do we want swimmers especially? It's because of hydrodynamic drag. If you're swimming across a pool, every time that you have to turn your body to take a breath or turn your head to take a breath, you slow down propulsion. So traditionally, swimmers might be taking, say, a breath every three or five strokes. But how about increasing the stroke rate between breaths to maybe every seven strokes? There, you're not losing hydrodynamic drag. And this is about functional breathing. How much exercise can you do for a given amount of breath? Well, in swimming, um, there's a disadvantage if you're disproportionately breathless. Because number one is you feel that you probably can't put your face in the water. And number two is that you'll be taking more breaths in between your strokes and that's going to hold you back. So for swimming, absolutely. For sprinters, you know, I was working with some of your Notre Dame athletes there and they were 400 meter sprinters and they were absolutely top class. Great, great guys, diligent, put it into practice. And some of the training runs that we did with them, well, here's like, we're thinking, what's the best way to get this? You know, they were doing practice runs of a 400 meter sprint. And I say, okay, let's change this a bit. I want you to nose breathe for the first 360 meters. And I used to stand 40 meters from the finish line of 400 meters. So they would nose breathe from the start of the 400 meters right up until they see me. And when they seen me at the 360th meter, they had to hold their breath on the exhale. And they had to sprint to the finish without air. Now, why would we do that? It's because when is the athlete going to be most fatigued? It's going to be the last 25% or the last 10, even 10%, the last 10% of the race. And the race is won or lost on the very end. Well, what I'm doing is during some of their practice trainings, I'm subjecting them to, to an increased load by depriving them of air, and that's forcing their body to make adaptations. So then when it comes to the real thing, I don't care how they breathe during the real thing. During competition, it's not the time to focus on your breathing. Mm. The time to focus on your breathing is pre-competition to get it right so your body has made sufficient adaptations um, so that you're, you know, 
you're, you're reaching your full potential during the competition. But there are a couple of things we do do pre-competition. Number one is I want to have the athlete having good sleep. It's really important. And with breathing exercise, we can help with that because we can get the athlete out of a sympathetic tone into more parasympathetic, into a rest and relaxation. We get them nose breathing, have them wearing the tape, not to be too cold, not to be too hot, etc. And then when they wake up in the morning, um, pre-match competition, I have them do some relaxation. I do some reduced breathing in order so they focus their minds. But now they're too relaxed. So then I have them do some strong breath holds. Um, that's to push the body. And it's also to get the spleen to contract. So basically, if you do five strong breath holds, it forces your spleen to release more red blood cells into circulation. And the effect of that, it can last up to five hours. So if you were to do them, say, before a race, um, you can, with increased spleen and contraction, you're increasing your hemoglobin. And that's your oxygen carrying capacity. So you're able to get more oxygen to the, to the, the muscles. Now, if you do five or six strong breath holds, then you're too acidic. So I have them then do 30 seconds of hyperventilation to get rid of the acid. So we kind of have little, you know, pre, pre-competition preparation, starting with sleep the night before, but ultimately it's starting. How long does it take to make get adaptations? Four weeks. That's what it is. You know, the, the, the recent paper that we're just putting up on our, on our website, improving repeated sprintability in athletes, in four weeks is all it took. And they replaced two HIIT sessions, two high-intensity interval sessions, training sessions, with breath holding on the exhalation. And uh, the control group didn't make the gains, only the individuals, the rugby players. And these were elite, and usually at that level, you know, there's not, there's not all that much of a difference in terms of margin between one athlete and another. Um, but it increased it quite significantly. Very interesting stuff. Fascinating. Um, Patrick, I'm just about to wrap it up, but I just want to touch on one thing for, uh, for people out there. For those out there that have anxiety or panic attacks, yes. what advice can you give them? Really what I'd start doing is just pay attention to your breathing. Start by that. You know, Ask yourself the question, are you breathing through your nose or mouth at any one time? You know, how frequently do you mouth breathe? Do you sigh a lot? Do you breathe using your upper chest? Measure your pulse score. If it's less than 25 seconds, there's huge room for improvement. There is a breathing recovery exercise, which will be the easiest one to start with. And because people with panic attacks, there's two subsets. Some people with panic attack have no problem doing exercise involving air hunger. The other subset of people who are prone to panic attacks when they practice the exercise involving air hunger, it's almost bringing on a panic attack. Now, that's good, but we have to handle it, handle it delicately because otherwise, you know, it brings on so much panic and fear. and you, We don't need to do that. So what I'd suggest is there's a breathing recovery exercise that's in the book. Um, you'll probably get it online as well. If you look at our YouTube channel, oxygenadvantage.com, I put up quite, sorry, or even just YouTube channel, Oxygen Advantage, I put up quite a few resources there, including exercise that you can practice with. Start becoming more aware of your breathing. And the other thing I'd say is don't take the big and deep breaths that people tell you to take. Mm. It doesn't do anything in terms of improving oxygen. Like when I say, to, when somebody comes into me and, you know, they're coming in with anxiety or stress or panic, I say, like, how do you breathe when you get stressed? I said, do, do your breathing. Does your breathing get faster or does it get slower? They tell me their breathing gets faster, it's more upper chest, they sigh more, they have noticeable breathing. And then I'd ask them, you know, show me a deep breath that you usually take. And they show me this big, fast breath that's like a big sigh that's noticeable breathing. I said, there's no difference. All you're doing is with that deep breath, you're amplifying your already stressed response. And as, as I asked them the question then, how would you feel if you took 10 of those big breaths? And they say, well, I feel lightheaded or I feel dizzy. Well, then we have to ask, what's happening? As you take the big breath, you're getting rid of too much carbon dioxide. And as you're losing carbon dioxide from the blood, it's causing your blood vessels to constrict. So the carotid arteries, which are feeding the brain with, ox- with blood flow and oxygen, they are constricting in response to your big breaths. Now, anybody suffering from stress, anxiety, and panic, the last thing that we need to do is to be reducing oxygen delivery throughout the brain. And even traditionally, if somebody was experiencing a panic attack, they 
traditionally they would have been handed a brown paper or a paper bag of some sort. The purpose of the paper bag was to trap the carbon dioxide that was leaving their body, to bring back in the carbon dioxide, to help assist with dilation of the blood flow, and also with release of oxygen from the red blood cells to the brain. So, you know, this is this is not new information. Um, and I'd say people practice it. I did, if you want to kind of get an insight into a quick summary of the exercise and practice them, I did a TED talk. Um, so if you just put in my name, it's Patrick McKeown and put in TED, you'll be able to see it's a 17 minute talk. I'm talking about the effect of poor breathing patterns on stress, craniofacial development, asthma, snoring, just as we were talking here with Bill. But I also give the people in the audience, I put them through the exercises. Um, so this way then you can learn firsthand, you know, and practice it for a week and see how it goes. Switch to nose breathing for a week. When you wake up in the morning, check if your mouth is wet or dry. Your mouth should always be moist. If you're waking up in a dry mouth, you know, you need to get your sleep quality right. I was a psychotherapist there about a month ago, and I asked him, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, excellent, counseling, excellent, but let's look at sleep. If anybody is suffering from stress, anxiety, depression, panic attacks, I think it's vital that you improve their sleep. And nose breathing is going to be a first foundation with that. And speaking of sleep, I saw in your book you recommended sleeping on your front or left side, if I read that yes. correctly. Why not yes. the right side and why not the back? Yeah, the right side isn't too bad in fairness. Um, it's really about the restriction to your breathing. How much air do you breathe if you're on your front or your left side? Now, sleeping on your front can put pressure on your neck, so you don't necessarily, you'd want to be careful with that. I think the main thing is to switch position. You, if you sleep on your left side, you're, unlike, you're likely to have less GERD or acid reflux. That can be, you know, for somebody who's suffering with that or if they have sleep issues. Um, there has been some research showing that by sleeping on your left side, reflux considerably reduces. Back is worst. You know, even people with obstructive sleep apnea, the condition I spoke about at the start, where there's collapse of the airways during sleep, 50% of people with obstructive sleep apnea have what's called positional sleep apnea. And that means that that group of individuals, if they sleep in their back, their apneas will double. Now, that's huge. Um, because literally, if you're in your back, your tongue is likely more likely to fall into the airway and your jaws are going to fall back into the airway. You stop breathing, or at least you will have some restriction to your breathing called a hypopnea. But both of those things are going to adversely affect the quality of your sleep. So back sleeping is just not good. Um, your left side is the best. Right side is pretty, it's not bad. And your front is good. It's not without its own issues, the front, um, especially in terms of pressure on the neck. Mm, very interesting. Yeah, I'm, I'm someone that switches from left to right. <laughs> I think it's best. Yeah, yeah. Um, fantastic. Uh, Patrick, as a final wrap up question, do you have any last words of wisdom or anything you would like to leave our audience with? Yeah, you know, it's, this is ultimately breathing is something, give it the attention it deserves. It, it's got a bad rap over the years. And a lot of that's because of misinformation out there. And if you're, if you've tried breathing exercise before and you felt no benefit, yeah, no, I, I can see that. Um, let's start slowing down your breath and reducing your breathing to the point that you feel air hunger. See, does it change your body temperature? Can you influence your body temperature in three minutes? Can you open up your nose in a few minutes? And can you improve your sleep quickly? And then you will know the difference between good breathing and poor breathing. Great stuff, Patrick. And if people want to learn more about you, where can they find you? Oxygenadvantage.com. The book is The Oxygen Advantage. And our YouTube channel is Oxygen Advantage. Patrick, it was a pleasure having you on the show. And thanks so much for coming on. Excellent, Bill. Many thanks. There it is, my interview with Patrick. Thank you so much for listening. And as always, if you want the timestamped show notes and links to everything we discussed in this episode, just head over to anchorsofhealth.com slash 26. That's it for me, and I'll see you in the next episode. Peace. 